A Stairway to Heaven? Secrets in Santa Cruz? Welcome to Exploring Santa Cruz, a bi-weekly program alternately hosted by Jean Kratzer and me, Matilda Rand. We will take some phone calls at the end of the program for listener comments and stories. The number will be 900-5773. In today's program, we will discuss the book Secret Walks and Staircases in Santa Cruz by Debbie Bulger and Richard Stover. Debbie Bulger has lived in Santa Cruz for over 30 years. She is the author and editor of many publications and brochures, including the memoir In the Thrill of the Night and Other Tales from a 50s Childhood. Since retiring from a healthcare career, she has advocated for pedestrian safety. Richard Stover has lived in Santa Cruz for almost 40 years. His background in physics and astronomy gave him the skills to utilize data from the OpenStreetMap project to create the maps contained in this book. His photographs have been published in the Ventana and the Desert Sage. He's retired from the Lick Observatory. Welcome to the program, Debbie and Richard. Thank you. Thank you. The first question, of course, is what made you write this book? Probably my interest in pedestrian issues in Santa Cruz and walking. About 20 years ago, we started walking for transportation rather than driving everywhere. And uh, I also served on a number of city and county committees dealing with pedestrian issues. For example, the Master Transportation Study and the Mission Street Widening Task Force and the Active Transportation Committee for the city, actually, and the county of Santa Cruz. So all of those things contributed to the idea behind the book. And as we started uh, walking more, we discovered all of these wonderful passageways and stairways and just the exciting Santa Cruz and all the wonderful things that you can see when you walk. Fantastic. Anything to add, Richard? Well, as Debbie has described, she's really been the driving force behind this uh, the entire time and has been involved in the pedestrian issues for for many, many years. And so we've always gone on on, uh, walks in in the area. And as Debbie mentioned, we've tried to do more and more walking instead of driving. So it was just kind of a natural thing. And, you know, when we started talking about the book and Debbie wanted to, was, had ideas about it, and I said, well, maybe I can help to make the maps and things. And so it's just sort of built from there. Great. Yeah. So actually that brings me to my next question is, how did the two of you collaborate on, on secret walks and staircases in Santa Cruz? Um, we each sort of took different areas uh, of expertise. I wrote the text. And initially set the uh, the plan for the different walks, but then we did the walks, and then we together collaborated as we walked through the areas, maybe changing some of the routes and looking at the the areas. Richard is a computer whiz, uh, in my estimation, and uh, was able to create the maps through his magic on the computer. And he also was a very good photographer and took most of the pictures. So we sort of worked side by side and we also worked together on the different issues. Right, and of course some of those photos in the book are of course about the different buildings and staircases and things we can see. But there are also little vignettes of beautiful plants in between the chapters and that I thought was a really nice addition to it and I assume both of you worked on that. I think you did this with Photoshop or something, Debbie, after a photo was taken? Yes, I did the layout and the design of the book using Photoshop and also InDesign for the for the layout. As we did the walks, we pointed out often to each other the different things that we saw When you walk, you see so much more than you can see from a car and even from a bicycle. And so 
there were all these plants, interesting plants and animals all about us. And I've long been a member of the California Native Plant Society and also the Sierra Club. So we're used to looking around us at the plants and animals that join us in this wonderful place, Santa Cruz. Now, the big question that people may have in mind is, how long did it take you to write this book? Oh, I think we started about six years ago with the idea and, you know, sort of slowly worked on it, looked at the different routes and things, and but really got into completing it, doing a lot of the work once we got into the pandemic and basically couldn't do much else and just work <laughs> at home. And this was a perfect opportunity to put all our energies into doing this instead of just going crazy stuck at home. It took about a year just to figure out where we would do the routes, what the actual walks would be. I wanted them to be as much of a loop as possible so people could end up where they started and could see new, new things along the way. But when you also do a walk out and back, and it's not necessarily a loop, you see different things on the way back. Things look different when you're going somewhere and then when you're coming back. And we learned that, I've learned that, from years of hiking and navigating in the uh, Sierra Nevada mountains. We do a lot of backpacking, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very important when you are not on a trail, when you're going cross-country, that you look behind yourself as you go, so you know what it looks like going in the other direction. That's actually a really great uh, observation. I noticed that too when I'm walking in the pinnacles. Thank you so much for pointing that out. And actually, I found that your the range of walks that you have in the book, there's quite a variety. And on top of it, I noticed that you say, okay, if you want to, you can then make this turnaround, but it's not exactly turnaround, it's still a loop. And I thought that was really magnificent what you did. So let me tell a little bit about the walk that I took, because of course, okay. my friend and, and I, my, we always walk. And she gave me the book and somebody else gave it, the book to her. So she thought it was great for us to go and take a walk. So the first walk we did was walk number five. And at some point at walk number five, you get to the Chinatown Bridge, which of course recently, which is not in the book yet, but recently they erected the wonderful monument. And so we were observing it, we were commenting it, and so did other people. And then there were three women there and they turned around and they saw us and they saw us with the book in hand. It was very <laughs> funny. It was like, oh, I got that book. I got it last week from Bookshop. And the other one said, well, I couldn't get it because it was almost sold out and I have it on reserve there. Anyway, so that was really nice. And it actually created a nice interaction between the five of us. And then we did our own little shortcut. So we went straight from there to the Swanton House on Soquel. And, and thank you so much for putting in architectural and historical information that in a very concise way helps us to get to know our town a lot better. And of course, the big thing about the Swanton House was that there used to be a different one. And that was moved to around the corner on Ocean View Avenue. And then you tell us about the two big trees that are there. They're really beautiful trees and some a little bit more about the history. So that gave my friend and I some things to talk about, especially how about moving a house? I mean, it's easy to say, you know, it's easy these days on a computer. You just drag it and you put it somewhere else. No, it was a whole science. And I remember actually from studying Watsonville history that around the 1900s, moving houses was a big business. Anyway, so from there we go to Ocean View Avenue while we're talking about, you know, moving houses. And we saw the old house, which is still in very good shape, on 590 Ocean View Avenue. But then, of course, right away after that, you tell us on 419 Ocean View Avenue, there is this around the house railroad track. And I never had seen it. I never knew about it. And so we, of course, observed it. And I think they're making some changes to it. It was very interesting to see. The people weren't there, so 
we didn't bother them, and I'm not sure if that's good or not, if they want to talk about it when people walk by the house. And, and for your listeners, that's a model railroad track. That is a model railroad track, that's right, yeah. And then well, my friend loves Ocean View Avenue because she has walked there often when she goes to Ocean View Avenue Park, which is at the end of the road. And so, of course, we had to watch, and she gave comments about a lot of these homes that she knew a lot about, which was really interesting, too. And so it's great to go on these walks with somebody else because, you know, somebody else knows something that you don't know and that yes. might not be in the book yet. Anyway, on Ocean View Avenue, by the obelisk, there is a bench overlooking the ocean. So, of course, we sat down and it was a gorgeous day. So two people come by and they turn around and they see us sitting there and they said, beautiful day for a walk, right? And we said, yeah. And then they see the book and, of course, the woman says right away, oh, I got that book. <laughs> <laughs> so within an hour of walking with our books, we had two great conversations with people. So I think that's what's happening with this book. Have you experienced that? We have not run into anyone yet going on one of the walks with the book in hand. We have been in bookshop when someone was looking at the book on the shelf and then decided to buy it. And we were on a, a very long walk in the upper UC campus and part of Wilder Ranch about a week ago. And we met someone who recognized me. And they had bought the book, and they were talking about it. They didn't have it with them. So that's been our experience so far. Now, when, when the two of you went around deciding on the routes, did you have other people give you feedback? Uh, yes. Yeah, we had several friends and relatives go on hikes. We'd uh, you know, give them a, a chapter and see if they could do it. See if the you know the, the instructions made sense, whether the pictures and the maps helped them. And that helped us, you know, refine what we said. If it was unclear to them, we tried to make it clearer. And of course they would also give us useful feedback, suggestions of things that we should have put in and didn't and that sort of thing. So yeah, we had lots of friends and relatives helping us. When we went down from Ocean View Avenue Park to San Lorenzo Boulevard. We noticed at the bottom of the hill, there was a new crossing. Uh, I think you called it an RRFB. Yes. What, what does it stand for? That stands for Rectangular Rapid Flash Beacon. But of course, that wasn't in the book because you have us go down safely on San Lorenzo Boulevard and then cross at Jesse Street. How are you dealing with changes that are happening in the city right now? And how do you feel about some of those changes? We are looking for feedback uh, from our readers for future changes, and you'll be happy to note that the next printing, which is in process now, has that correction with the new crossing included in that, and the map has been changed. So you no longer will have to walk to Jesse Street <laughs> if you don't want to. Yes, please, we're asking our readers to send us suggestions and corrections. And there's information in the preface, I believe, on how to contact us. Right, yes, that's correct. Now, you are looking for changes yourself. What would you like the city to do to make this, these walks even better and safer? One of the things that we note is the signage, the street signs for, for people in the city many of the street signs are designed only for drivers. So if you're on a one-way street, for example, the signs are only facing the drivers that are going the way that you can go on a one-way street. But of course, a pedestrian can go both ways. That's a good example. Mm -hmm. Or on another one, on the walk, I think the walk that you went on is the one where you go through the little park. Yeah. By the Barson, uh, right. yes. And you come out on the other side of the park and you, you don't, don't know, know where you are. Street. That's yeah. right. There's no sign there. So there are quite a few intersections of pedestrian paths and streets where there's no signage. Bethany Curve is another example of a path that comes up from Westcliff near Woodrow. 
and you cross many streets. The pedestrian path crosses many streets, and there are no street signs, so it's hard to know where you are. You you could look it up on your map on your smartphone, perhaps, if you have one, but otherwise you have no idea. Right, yeah. I hope that the city will hear and that uh, people, because actually you're giving some advocacy hints in your book as well, uh, partly <laughs> about making things safer and giving people a hint on where they can speak up, you know, politely, but uh, speak up. Did you do that on purpose, the advocacy hints? How did you deal with that? Is that difficult to do, to tell people what to do? And did you like doing it? Well, my mother always said, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. <laughs> <laughs> and I believe that. And if people want to see something and some improvements for walking in the community, they need to let city council members know and also in the county as well. And that's why you're correct. I give addresses on page 258, actually, in the book on uh, how to send an email to the city or the county or how to report a hazard like uh, bushes overgrown on the sidewalk. So you have to go out in the street people then can participate in helping improve things for making walking safer. Right. I want to remind our listeners, they are listening to Exploring Santa Cruz today. We have Debbie Bulger and Richard Stover with me. And they were talking about their book, Secret Walks and Staircases in Santa Cruz. In the meantime, Debbie and Richard, there are a lot of pedestrian shortcuts, which sometimes go really closely by a lot of homes. And so would people living in that area mind us walking with their books through their living area? I don't know if people would mind or not. The fact is that many of these routes, they do go by homes, but they are public access points. So they were created by the city or the Coastal Commission or other entities to preserve public access on those paths and staircases. Mm -hmm. So I may or may not mind if someone drives by my house in a car, and I may or may not mind if someone walks by my house on foot. Mm -hmm. But Those are public access ways. Right. So I'm pointing that out. And sometimes there are signs that are very cleverly worded, and we have some pictures of some of those signs, that sort of discourage people from walking by. But they don't say you can't do it. Right. You can do it, and it is legal. So those are probably put up by the people who mind, but others don't, I'm sure. Right. And, and of course, as we are walkers and discoverers of our town and area, we want to make sure that we always stay positive when we encounter people. I think it is a wonderful idea to be careful. And you want to stimulate communication with people but always keep it positive. We have a caller on line one. Caller, you're on the air. Hello. Um, I wanted to say that I have already Debbie's book, In the Thrill of the Night, and it was really a terrific book that brought back a lot of memories to me. I am 91 years old, and uh, I am very into I used to be a, a strong Sierra Club member when... Debbie, I remember you used to write the Fantana Sierra Club thing, and you were the editor, I believe. And But I can't do a very strenuous walking. I have to use a walker at this point. And I'm wondering if any of the walks there, if it's indicated, if they are okay for people with my disability. Thank you. Also, thank you for the compliment about the earlier book. I appreciate that a lot. We did not indicate that in the book. We looked into it, and it was fairly complicated to, to put that information in the book. Most of the walks are not accessible to wheelchair users, although many parts of them are. Certainly Westcliff is, and Eastcliff, again, sections. But in the Eastcliff walk, for example... The walk goes from Moran Lake uh, on a path 
that's a dirt path that would not be accessible probably for someone using a walker. Yeah, dirt would be hard, but sidewalks are okay. Yes. Not all the sidewalks have curb cuts. Some of them do, and some of them don't, and some of them have old-fashioned curb cuts that are not ADA compliant. What I would suggest for someone, if they have the ability to look at the street view on Google Maps, or if they have a friend who could help them if they're not really computer savvy, that they could look at those views and would see that sections of them. We didn't go through, it was so complicated because of the curb cut issues Sure. And, and other things that we didn't rate them because many of them, most of them had areas that were not accessible to everyone. So which means, of course, again, Debbie, that if the city wants more people to enjoy these incredible walks, that we need to let them know where there needs to be more curve cuts. Caller, is this answer satisfactory to you? Yes, it is, and I'm glad to have that. So I think what I'll do is my daughter will drive me past all all the walks, and I can eyeball it and see if I can do it on my walker. That is a great, great, great idea. Thank you so much for calling. And if you want to give us feedback on issues like that, we'd love to hear from you. I have a question that I didn't ask yet. There are certain things in the book and you hinted to it that there are certain things in the book that may not be as familiar for people and they might want a little bit more explanation. And I assume, again, Debbie and Richard, this is something that you want people to tell you for future editions. Yes, we certainly are looking for feedback, but there are also things we deliberately did not describe everything on a walk. We wanted people to discover things on their own as they, as they did the walk. But I'll give you an example of something we would like more information about. There are two benchmarks. One we call out, and that's on uh, North Branch of Fort A Drive near the intersection with the Berkeley Way. And there's another on East Cliff as it goes up the hill to the Trestle Bridge. And they were put there by the Army Corps of Engineers, and I have not yet been able to find out why they were put there. I believe it has something to do with the flood in 1955 of Santa Cruz. But if anyone knows the answer about those benchmarks, I certainly would love to hear about it. And a benchmark is a big brass disc, usually embedded in concrete, so it can't move. It's some kind of marker. We we always find these often on peaks, on the tops of peaks in the Sierras, and it gives the coordinates and elevation of the top of the peak. But we're not quite sure what these ones are doing in Santa Cruz. See, listeners, you can be sleuths and you can help our authors Debbie Bolger and Richard Stover to even improve on secret walks and staircases in Santa Cruz. I want to thank you both, Debbie and Richard, for sharing some background information about the book. You know, the book is filled with interesting walks around Santa Cruz, as well as educational, entertaining stories. I really appreciate that. Thank you, Debbie and Richard. I'm sure we'll talk some more at some other point. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you at home for listening to Exploring Santa Cruz on KSQD Santa Cruz. Tune in to KSQD in two weeks at this time for another program with Gene Kratzer. I will return in four weeks.